This is CPSC 526, 626, Lecture 7 on TLS. So TLS, Transport Layer Security, it used to be called SSL, and SSL will still often be used to describe it, which is Secure Sockets Layer. Um, it's an evolution, so TLS is the effectively the new version of SSL. It's been around for quite some time. It's been improving. There's been vulnerabilities found, and they get fixed, and so on. And TLS is basically the standard for doing internet communication securely. So if you are communicating between two places over the internet, and you're not using TLS to as part of that communication, there should be a very good reason why. There should be a, a very compelling reason why TLS is not the tool that you actually want to use in this situation. And maybe it's because it's UDP, and for UDP there's a DTLS protocol, datagram TLS, uh, based on the same design. Or maybe there's some particular nature to this protocol of, for communication that you're using. Uh, but the key point is that not using TLS to communicate over the internet is a decision that should be rigorously defended, justified, explained, and so forth. To not use TLS is to go without access to the most scrutinized and analyzed and widely deployed and easy to use, relatively speaking, means of achieving security. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about how TLS actually works and uh, the, the types of the protocols and a bit about how it evolved over the time. And we'll look at some of the communication that TLS does. The primary goal of the TLS protocol is to provide a secure channel between two communicating peers. And the only requirement for these two peers in order to use TLS is that they have a reliable in-order data stream. That is TCP, for example, provides this property. So TLS is a protocol that you just run on top of a socket and effectively it provides a secure communication channel between the two endpoints of that socket. And all you need is what TCP provides, reliable in-order delivery. The guarantees that SSL or TLS try to provide is end-to-end -end secure communication in the presence of a network attacker. So this is an adversary on the network that the communication goes through and can be an active attacker this is the classic Alice is talking to Bob and Eve is somewhere in the middle. And the idea of end-to-end -end security means that there's only two places that actually know what the encryption key is in order to decrypt communications or is able to break the confidentiality of communications. And that is the two endpoints that are actually talking. Alice is talking to Bob. They may travel through a whole bunch of routers on the internet as the traffic goes through. The network attacker could be anywhere along those that sequence of routers that bridge the connection between Alice and Bob. But only Alice and Bob are able to read the communication. So end-to-end -end com secure communication. And... This definition of end-to-end -end is important as well because oftentimes, especially if you think of uh, things such as social media, you may be sending a message using a platform, a direct message up using some sort of platform, say Facebook, and Alice and Bob are thereby communicating through a trusted third party, tr uh, a Trent in this case, which is the entity that has a communication from Alice, Say Alice wants to send Bob a message. This Trent receives the message and then delivers the message on to the other entity, to the Bob. And so this is not considered end-to-end -end communication. It's only when this tr entity, this trusted party that's responsible for receiving a message to be sent and then delivering it onwards to the other person, if they cannot understand the message, they're only trusted to deliver it, then we consider that to be end-to-end -end communication. 
And it's not end-to-end -end communication if there's some entity that isn't the communicating parties that's able to actually read all the communications and so forth. So messages in, say, Facebook might not be visible by the general public, but they're still visible by Facebook, for example. One feature of this is that there's no need to provide trust in these intermediaries if you're doing end-to-end -end secure communication. The attacker can completely own the network. They can own, for instance, an ISP. All of your network traffic might go through the adversary. But if you have end-to-end -end encryption and the adversary doesn't have the key, then there's nothing that they can do. So TLS is trying to protect against threats such as eavesdropping. For that, we use encryption. So we encrypt the message so no one can read it, providing confidentiality. Against manipulation, things like injection of messages, man in the middle attacks, and for this, we add integrity. We have replay protection. And against impersonation, meaning that you, Alice could have a secure connection with somebody, but Alice might want to know who that somebody is, right? If, you, if Alice wants to go to a news website and sees the lock icon, meaning that there's encryption happening, Alice wants to not only have an encryption, an encrypted connection with someone, Alice wants it with the person that she thinks she's talking with. Now, the design of TLS, it's only the server that's authenticated normally. There is a client verification as well, so you can have client authentication, but typically that's not done. Typically what happens is that Alice is a person who just wants to go to a website and read the news, and the news website doesn't care who Alice is and whether or not it's Alice. What Alice wants is a secure connection so that she knows she's getting actually the the website cbc.ca at, at this particular point in time is getting the actual news correctly. And Alice knows, has an idea of who she wants to talk to. But a news website, a web server, wouldn't normally care who all the clients are. That's just serving the website to whoever visits. Now, this of course will be different if you say you want to log in, and in this case, you establish a TLS connection to a website, and then you get a password box, and you enter your password, and, and that's how client authentication is typically done on the web. But TLS does have provisions for client authentication using the same certificate infrastructure that we previously discussed. This is how Alice knows that she's talking to cbc.ca, because cbc.ca gives a certificate, there is a provision in TLS where Alice could also present a certificate to the server instead of, for instance, entering a password. So the mental model you should have when thinking about TLS and the design of TLS, imagine that you're checking your email and you're at an internet cafe. You're connecting with the public Wi-Fi. There's no, there's no security. There's no password protection. It's just open public Wi-Fi. Everything that is sent is just visible to anyone nearby. The router itself, who knows if it's been compromised? Who knows if someone has been able to install malware on the router at the cafe? You have no reason to trust this. It's going through an ISP, which for all purposes, let's just say they're an evil ISP. So an ISP that there's no reason to trust them. And you're in a country that wants to spy on you. You're not even in your home country or you, you may very well be in your home country, and that country still also wants to spy on you. Nevertheless, with all of these problems, with all of these concerns to your privacy, can you still be secure? Can you actually get your email and have it be the case that no one other than you and the email server saw that information actually going through, that none of these adversaries along the way were able to interfere with your communication and to, or insert traffic that shouldn't have been there or something like that. This is the goal of TLS, is to give security for normal use of web browsing with this kind of a threat model, where the only trusted entities are your computer and the server you're connecting to. So the history of SSL and TLS. It began in 1994. It was an internal Netscape design. Netscape was one of the first web browsers. And then it was released, SSL 2.0 was effectively the first release, but it had flaws. They were fixed with SSL 3.0. And SSL 3.0 was used 
for a while and eventually evolved into TLS as we know it now, TLS 1.0, which was standardized based on SSL 3.0. It became just the standardized version, not a Netscape a proprietary design or something like that, but rather the public standardized version, TLS. And then it was revised 2006 to 1.1. 2008 was 1.2, and this version was used for a decade until just recently TLS 1.3 was standardized, and uptake on 1.3 has been quite high. So 1.3 is now uh, quite widely used, and it fixed a number of issues with, with TLS that we'll talk about in this lecture. Where it sits in the network stack, if you remember, there's the physical layer, then link layer, the network layer, the transport layer. SSL sits above the transport layer. I recall it needs reliable in-order delivery. TCP gives us that. So assuming that there is a TCP connection between two places on the internet, that is a, a TCP socket, then we can, in a sense, speak TLS over that socket and effectively create a TCP socket that is also encrypted for whatever traffic is going through there. So it's not a protocol that works on HTTP, for example. It's not sitting on top of the application layer. It's not taking the HTTP protocol and making it secure, or taking the FTP protocol and making it secure, but rather it's taking any TCP socket and making that secure. So whatever Alice puts in on one end, Bob reads on the other end, knowing all of the guarantees of TLS apply, confidentiality, integrity, replay protection, and so forth. And then whatever protocol you actually want to speak is then secure because now you're speaking a, a protocol over a secure connection. So TLS in the network stack, it provides security to any application that's using TCP. So instead of using a TCP socket, use a TLS socket. Otherwise, the protocol should remain the same. You write, you read, and that is now provided extra security because of TLS. And the API to use TLS is similar to the socket interface. So it's easy to add security into an existing app or program. You just replace the, the standard socket and all the connect and write and all the stuff with the TLS equivalent. And then you have now security added. So the basics of the protocol has two phases. There's the handshake part, the handshake protocol, and the record protocol. The idea is, initially, Alice and Bob, they do a handshake. In this handshake, they figure out what encryption key to use. They figure out who they are. They do all the, the initial steps to actually bootstrap a secure communication. And then the record phase corresponds to just actual data being sent. So they're just called records, records of data. The data goes from Alice to Bob and Bob to Alice in the second phase. So the handshake is where the connection is established in the record phase is where the data is transmitted. Now, an application using TLS isn't going to need to worry about these details. They just write to the socket, read from the socket. But behind the scenes, when you're connecting, you're establishing this handshake. And then when you're writing and reading, you're doing these record connections. So the handshake uses public key crypto to establish shared secrets, so session keys, between the client and the server. And the record phase uses these secret session keys to actually do the communication, talking between the client and the server while providing confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of the data. The handshake part of the protocol, this runs between the client and the server. So for example, a web browser and a website, if you're using TLS to do a secure web browsing. The first part of the of the handshake is to negotiate the version of the protocol. So are you using TLS 1.1 or 1.2 or 1.3? And what cryptographic algorithms? Are you going to use AES 128-bit key or AES 256-bit key? What macking algorithm? Are you going to use SHA-1, SHA-256? All of these options need to be negotiated. A server may be able to speak many different things. It can speak in AES and it can speak in uh, the previous version, DES, or it can speak in using the hash function SHA-1 or SHA-256 or MD5, although it probably shouldn't. And all of these options are effectively available to the server and available to the client, but not necessarily all of them will be supported. Maybe some client don't use a particular algorithm or server refuses to use MD5 for a good reason. So this 
decision about what protocol to actually use has to be negotiated. And this is where the client and the server are able to communicate what exactly they can, their capabilities are and figure out what to use as a result. And then is the authentication of the server and optionally the client. And here we use digital certificates to learn about each other's public keys. So we've already talked about digital cert certificates or certs. The server simply sends its cert. It's signed by the certificate authority. The client can see this. Now it has the public key. Recall, Alice goes to google.com, but Alice doesn't know what google.com's public key is, so google.com just tells it. But Alice has no reason to trust that. So there's a certificate that is signed by a certificate authority, and Alice trusts the certificate authority and thereby can be certain that this is, yes, indeed the public key. And now at this point, there's an authentic channel, and we can use this authentic channel to do key negotiation. We can use public keys to sign the messages. They can authenticate each other. Typically, it's only the server, but of course, the client is also optionally authenticated. So the actual connection looks like this. There's a browser, we'll call it B, and the server, S. So the browser says to the server, sin. So this is just the standard TCP three-way handshake, sin, sin, ack, ack. So first, a TCP connection is established between browser and server. Then the browser says to the server, client, hello. My random number is blah, just gives a random number. I support TLS with RSA signatures, uh, AES-128, for the cipher and SHA-256 for the uses of the hash function, or I support an SSL older version with Diffie Hellman key exchange and triple des using MD5 hash function, or so on. It just lists all of the possible combinations of, they're called cipher suites, consisting of a signing algorithm, a hashing algorithm, a symmetric key algorithm, and the version of SSL as well. All of the different possible things that it can speak. And the server then replies with, here's my randomness, randomness from the server. Let's use, and then it just says it. Let's use TLS RSA AES 128 SHA-256. So the browser, the client, lists all of the things it can support, and the server then is the one that decides. We'll use this. And presumably, it's making this decision based on selecting from what the client said the most secure option that it in fact supports. The server then says to the browser, or returns to, to the browser, here's my certificate. All of this is around 2 to 3k. So this is the negotiation of a TLS connection. Now, the browser send the list of supported ciphers in the clear. Is this a problem? What could the attacker do? At this point, the network attacker can modify any of this data. It's not, there's no integrity. It's not encrypted. So, the attacker could add cipher suites that aren't supported by the client. The attacker could remove cipher suites, such as removing all the good ones and, and leaving just the bad ones, leaving the broken ones. Say that the attacker could break MD5 but can't break SHA-1, so the attacker would remove all the SHA-1 options from that list so that they're sort of forced to use an MD5 one. Is this a problem? Well, we'll get back to how we might protect against that, but I do encourage you now to think about what attacks could happen, given the fact that this data is, in a sense, malleable to the attacker, and uh, what could be done to prevent it. But keeping in mind, at this point, there is no key that has been negotiated between the client and the server. As well, the server just decides which cipher to use. Now, hopefully, it's making a good decision, but is this unilateral decision a good idea? And again, the reply is sent from the server to the browser in plain text. It can still be modified. The attacker could modify what the server replies with, for instance. Is this a problem? 
what attacks could be done and what could be done to stop it. And uh, there should be an exercise in the tutorial that is based around this. But at this point, the browser will then validate the certificate. So the server gives the browser the cert. The browser then has the cert. It has a list of trusted certificate authorities and is able to say, yes, this is the valid cert. Now I know the server's public key. Okay, at this point now, there is some security available. There is now the ability to create an authentic channel or an encrypted channel. The browser can encrypt something just for the server to see and the, or the server can sign something just for the browser to know. So at this point, we have, after getting a certificate, an authentic channel in one direction and an encrypted channel in the other direction. So browser to server could be encrypted, server to browser can be authentic. And we use this to then do a key negotiation. So there's a couple varieties of, of TLS. Uh, if we, for the RSA variety, the browser first constructs what's known as a pre-master secret, PS. And then the browser sends to the server the encryption of PS, the pre-master secret, encrypted with the server's public key. So the pre-master secret is encrypted with the server's public key, and this is used to derive four separate keys. Two integrity keys, IB and IS, and two encryption keys, KB and KS. So it's not that they negotiate one key, they, they negotiate four keys. Or in this case, the browser picks a pre-master secret, this pre-master secret then is used to create four keys. And so an important question here is why are there four keys? Why not just have one key? Why is there two encryption keys, for example? And the answer to that is that it protects against, or at least the two encryption keys protect against a replay attack or where an attacker reflex data back. The idea here is that one encryption key is for encrypting data from the client, the browser, to the server. So there's an encryption key that the browser uses to encrypt its outgoing stream of data. And there's another key that's used to encrypt the incoming data. So the server has one key to encrypt data and one key to decrypt data. And the client or browser similarly has one key to encrypt, which is the opposite of the one that the server uses to encrypt. So if you imagine the streams of data, one stream going from the browser to the server and one stream going from the server to the browser, they're encrypted with different keys. And the reason is that if the browser encrypted some data and sent it out to the server, an adversary could capture that data, not know necessarily what it is, but simply feed it back to the browser and the browser would decrypt it, right? The, the attacker doesn't know what the encryption key is, but the attacker by looking at the network traffic will see correctly encrypted data. Maybe it's able to have a good guess what that is, known plain text. And it's then, if it used the same key to decrypt the data it receives as it encrypts the data it sends, the attacker could simply replay back the data the client sent out back to the client, and the client would decrypt it, and it would make sense, and it would read it and understand it. So for this reason, we have one key for the outbound data and a different key for the inbound data to protect against exactly this attack. There's also historical reasons such as early stream ciphers, such as RC4 being used. The general idea is that TLS as a system supports a lot of different types of underlying cryptographic primitives, and it becomes uncertain if you combine different ones with the same stream, will it still work? So the sort of good idea then is to just separate out these streams. 
Second, for the integrity, it's the same idea. You might use one algorithm with a key for integrity, use another algorithm for with a key for encryption. These algorithms work entirely differently. And can we guarantee that for every single possible pair of algorithms, there isn't some weird existential case where using the same key for these different algorithms at the same time results in a security problem? Well, it's easier to just use different keys. It's not hard. You can just basically take the same key and hash it, for example, with the number one, two, three, and four to generate four different keys from the pre-master secret. So given that we can easily just have different keys, we might as well do so because then we don't need to worry about if we happen to choose this specific hashing algorithm or, or macking algorithm to do integrity and this particular cipher to do encryption using the same key, is there a, is there a complicated risk that might occur? easier to just not worry about that by using separate keys. Another question, and this is for the RSA TLS approach, what does this approach lack? So when the browser constructs a pre-master secret, it then encrypts this pre-master secret and sends it to the server, both the browser and the server generate four different keys from the pre-master secret. And so think about it for a moment. The answer is that it lacks forward security. That is, if ever the server's public key is compromised, or for ever reason, no matter how long into the future, it gets compromised, and we assume that a network attacker can just record all the traffic, so it has all the old traffic, well, even though you've long since stopped using the pre-master secret PS, it can still be revealed because you encrypted it with the server's public key, and that's now known forever. Once it gets exposed, this old communication session, which happened, occurred a long time ago, is at risk of being made public by virtue of you encrypting the key with the server's public key and then just delivering it to the server. So it lacks forward security. Now, after this handshake is done, there is a Mac on the dialogue that is then performed. So. After establishing exactly which algorithm to use, which was done in plain text, so it comes up with the conclusion, let's use SHA-1, and let's use this way of doing max, and let's you do this AES encryption with 128-bit. One After that negotiation is done, and then the exchange of keys, there is then a MAC on the dialog. So imagine the dialog just being the entire transcript of communication. Everything the browser said, everything the server said, you just write it all down like a script, and you say, here's a MAC of that. And both parties would have hopefully seen the same dialog, and therefore their MAC would be identical. If there was an attacker who modified messages, the server would have a different concept of the dialogue than the browser, and these two Macs wouldn't equal. Now, there's one way in which the attacker can still do this, which is that if the attacker knows there's a flaw on a particular macking algorithm and can alter the dialogue in the beginning so that they use this broken macking algorithm, then the serv or the adversary could actually compute the Mac on the dialogue for two different values of the dialogue and exchange it from the browser to the server and the server to the browser. And note here that these, Mac, these dialogues are encrypted with separate keys, the integrity key for the browser and the integrity key for the server. The fact that they're different is of benefit here because if the browser were to say to the server, here's the Mac of the dialogue, and the server replies, yeah, and here's also a Mac of the dialogue, that Mac would be the same. But by using different integrity keys, the Mac of the dialogue is now different. Now, there's other ways that could be resolved, but this is, since there are different integrity keys, we can just use that to achieve this, this goal, that the browser Macs it with its integrity key and the server Macs it with its integrity key. After this occurs, all... The, the handshake phase has ended, the record phase begins, all subsequent messages are then encrypted with a negotiated cipher. They're all numbered, sequentially numbered, so as to prevent replay attacks. So when I send out, here's message 5, and here's the data, 
the next one I send, here's message six, and here's the data, and so forth. So the attacker can't take an old message three and replay it later down the line to have some sort of complicated effect. They can't replay old messages because they would be out of line. And note that for the using two different keys for the outbound data and the inbound data, having these sequentially numbers helps prevent these replay attacks as well. But for instance, if you were expecting to receive message number five, but you've already sent an old message number five, that actually could be reflected back if you were to use the same key. Now, that's one key negotiation protocol or key establishment protocol for TLS. Another one, and one that's more widely used, and now as of version 1.3 is, is required, some variant of this. We'll get into the details after, but this is the Diffie-Hellman key negotiation protocol. And we've visited this before. The idea here is that both parties can have a plain text conversation, and as long as the channel is authentic, they both walk away with a learned secret that cannot be revealed just by looking at the, the dialogue itself. So both parties, as long as they can have a public conversation, they can walk away with a key that no one else knows but themselves. And this uh, gives us the property of forward secrecy. The, one, the first case, the RSA version, where you just invent a key and encrypt it and send it over, no forward secrecy, and you're using this, the confidentiality of the channel in order to, to establish a key. For Diffie-Hellman, you have forward secrecy, and you only need the authenticity of the channel to negotiate the key. So, how does the Diffie-Hellman work? The server, it occurs after the server says to the browser, here's my certificate. The server then says to the browser, well, here's the, the parameters, here's the, the generator G, here's the modulus P, and here's my side of the key negotiation, which is G to the A mod P. Server, remember, A pub uh, sends G to the A, given G to the A and G and P, you cannot compute A. So that's the basic security assumption for Diffie-Hellman that makes it works, and it's signed by the server. The browser knows the server's public key because it has the cert, so it can verify the signature and be sure, okay, this is indeed the key negotiation parameter as provided to me by the server. The browser then provides to the server its own g to the p g to the b mod p, and the result is that now both servers can compute their premaster secret g to the a b, and so with the premaster secret they do the same as before derive the four keys two for encryption two for integrity, they then do the MAC on their dialogue. And then all subsequent messages are encrypted with a negotiated cipher. And again, sequentially numbered to prevent replay attacks. So more or less the same thing, except the part where the key gets established is a little more interactive. It's not just the browser say, here's the, here's the key to use and it's encrypted, but there is a, a key negotiation that occurs. Now note that the server doesn't verify the browser. The browser doesn't give a signature on G to the B mod P. So it could be an Eve that's doing this. But from the server's perspective, it doesn't matter if it's talking to Eve or Bob. It's just a web server sending out data. If it wants to authenticate the user, it would need to do a client certificate, which is possible in TLS, or have them enter a password or something like that. But generally, when a web server is just giving a website to someone, it doesn't really care who it's giving a website to. But it matters to the person receiving the website that it is, in fact, the actual website that they're trying to receive. So that's why the server is able to sign its key negotiation parameter, and the browser just tells it what it's going to use. And now the server has established a secure communication channel with somebody, but it doesn't actually know who. It just has an IP address. That's the entity that it's talking to. And it doesn't matter if it were Eve or if it were Bob or Alice. It's just someone out there is getting this website and we have a secure channel to send it. All right, let's take another look at the TLS protocol again, this time switching to use its nomenclature. So 
all of the different components, and we'll, we'll look at some Wireshark uh, examples of packet captures later and actually see the TLS handshake in practice. The client hello is the name of the message that it begins the whole process. So browser sends to server, client hello, server sends to browser, server hello, here's the certificate, a server key exchange, a certificate request, possibly if it wants to do client certificates, and then the server hello done. Browser then says to the server, certificate, this is optional, if it's going to do client certificates. The client key exchange, so if you're doing a, this is where the client would deliver to the server the key or would give its key negotiation parameter. And a certificate verify message, which again is used for client certificate ver verification. It just is a signature that the client then provides with the same public key as the certificate states is proving thereby control over that corresponding private key. At this point, the client and server switch to the, negoti the negotiated cipher. They do, then the browser sends to the server a finished message that includes the Mac of their dialogue, and the server then sends to the browser a finished message, again, with the Mac of the dialogue. We won't get into the details here. I just wanted to point it out so you know it exists if ever you find yourself programming something that is going to be using UDP instead of TCP and you still want to have security, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can use DTLS, Datagram TLS. It is TLS except designed for UDP-based protocols, accounting for the fact that you no longer have reliable in-order guaranteed delivery of messages. UDP is not as widely used as TCP, so DTLS is also not as widely used as TLS, but it is still standardized and it has still been considered uh, for all sorts of security risks and attacks and so forth. So this would be the best practice then to use if you need a UDP communication. Then when we have some changes recently, a couple of years ago, when we introduced TLS 1.3. So among the changes that occurred, the sort of most important ones, is there was an enormous reduction in the availability of cipher suites. It used to be the case that every combination of algorithm and macking and uh, hash function, they were all just enumerated. And most users really don't have a strong preference about this. They just want the most secure option. And inundating any developer with a, you know, a huge array of options, many of which are in unsuitable, was not a good idea and actually resulted in frequent security problems. Just misconfigured servers that are using TLS but not using it correctly, and so the result is actually not security. It removed that RSA option. So now if you're using TLS 1.3, you have forward security. It's based on Diffie-Hellman. There's Diffie-Hellman based on this discrete logarithms, but there's also Diffie-Hellman based on elliptic curves, which is similar but different. And now, anytime you're doing a TLS connection, you with 1.3, you are forced, in a sense, to have the nice property of forward security. The dialogue is now signed by the server, so it's not simply a Mac of the dialogue, but it's actually signed. And what's nice about this is, again, as I alluded to, it could be the case that an adversary convinces both client and the server by attacking the unsecured public part of the conversation where they do their cipher suite negotiation, have them use a broken macking algorithm, something that the attacker can control, and by assuming that they can't break the public key signature, then at least signing the dialogue is an extra safeguard so you know that, yes, in fact, this was not tampered with. It also has a one round trip and even a zero round trip mode. Uh, zero corresponds to a, a session resumption. The idea here being that you don't need to redo the entire negotiation, the entire handshake if you've already chatted with the server. You can, in a sense, just pick up where you left off. And as well, the original TLS had two round trips, and now the parts of the protocol have been combined. So 
the key exchange and the cipher suite negotiation are occurring simultaneously. So that's the one round trip mode. There's an interesting caveat as it relates to TLS and something that uh, can can trip you up when you're looking at network traffic corresponding to TLS and was a bug in, in Wireshark as well in terms of how it rendered uh, a TLS packet for some time, which is that for re the same reasons that make doing anything on the internet hard and painful and anytime you want to update or change or improve anything basically impossible, the protocol that is stated when you're doing a, a, a message, when you're trying to establish a TLS 1.3 connection, the protocol is fixed to be 1.2. So now the official standard for TLS when you're doing your negotiation of the, when you're stating what version you're using is to lie about what version you're using, say that you're using an old version, and then in some additional extension fields actually have a, a note saying, oh, by the way, I'm actually using version 1.3. Ignore the version 1.2. And the reason is because companies put out hardware that sits in the internet and it fails when its value is not the value that it's expecting. It wasn't designed to work properly if things ever improved or there was a new version. And as a result, now we just have to have this encoded in the standard that version 1.3 of TLS and presumably all versions to come will just always state that they're version 1.2 and then somewhere in the extension fields actually give their real version. And we'll look at an example of a packet like that. As for the cipher suites, you can see that the menu, this is the older version, TLS 1.2. You can see version 1, SSL version 3. This was what it looked like before. Just a small sample of all the possible combinations. But if you just filter out or if you filter the ones that include the word null, this is also across the entire menu. And these null cipher suites correspond to simply not doing anything in that position. So null SHA-256 means you'll use SHA-256 for your macking algorithm, but you won't use anything for your encryption. And why do they have this all these null cipher suites? Well, maybe they can be useful for testing or as a way of present of disabling some feature if you didn't want it. But ultimately, this did more harm than good because it allowed for misconfigurations and it allowed for tampering that resulted in actual people not having encryption when they thought so. So for TLS 1.3, it has become much simpler. It's simply you either use AES-256 with SHA-384 or use AES-128 with SHA-256 or use the cha-cha cipher, which is a, a another contender. It was uh, not selected to be the advanced encryption standard, but it was a contender at the time. And so it's available as a second algorithm. So in case we discover a flaw with AES, we already have this backup. We can just switch over to cha-cha uh, without, without worrying. As you can see, this menu of options makes it much easier to to not make a bad selection than when you're just presented with every single possible combination of algorithms and you're expected to select the best one when, again, most of the time, you don't care which one you're using, you just want to use the secure one. So this was a design decision intentionally to remove a whole lot of cipher suites that should just never be selected in practice anyways. So here we have an example of a packet capture these are, are known as PCAPs, or packet capture. They just are the collection of all the network traffic, and then they're contextualized by a tool. So Wireshark is one of the, the tools. This is just a website that's basically looks exactly like what Wireshark looks like when it runs. And it contextualizes all of the information that is in the packet. So in like what's actually being sent would be these bytes here. Now, or these octets. Now, it's interpreted here on the left that it's an IP packet, it's a TCP packet, it tells us the source port, it tells us the destination port. If you actually then take a look at the various parts of the packet as on along each of these fields, source port is 35120, 
we can see where it highlights it in the actual transmission. These would be the bytes corresponding to that, and the destination port, and so forth. So this is for one single packet, and now here we have a whole bunch of packets that were collected in, in a short amount of time. You can see it was this, this packet number 18 was sent seven seconds in. And with the tool Wireshark, you can make your own PCAPs, or you can use the tool TCP Dump, also available for a standard Unix-based system. And with this, you're able to capture all of the, the network traffic that's occurring, so you can actually look at what's, what's happening. So you can, for instance, start running TCP Dump, go to a website, stop running TCP dump and look at the actual TLS negotiation that occurred and then what exactly happened all the packets along the way. So here we see a syn, synac, and then the ack, exactly as we described, followed by the client hello. So now we can see that it's been contextualized. It's a TCP packet carrying at this level, the secure sockets layer, SSL. It's a TLS version 1.3 content type handshake version as described TLS 1.0, 0301. So it's lying about what version it is. It's actually 1.3, but later on in the handshake protocol, we see that there is the true version of TLS being used in one of these options. supported versions, version 1.3, draft 28, 26, 27. And as well, the other fields that are being sent along with it, here is the key share. So this would be the one side of the Diffie-Hellman key negotiation. We can expand that. It has length 36 bytes, consists of a key share entry, and here is the actual raw bytes corresponding to the client-provided randomness. So what's nice about these tools is all of the contextualization for these standard protocols is done for you. Here, this is what it would look like if you just saw the raw bytes, but you, it actually translates what all of this means into the actual semantics of the protocol that's occurring. And it separates out the TCP part of it, the IP part of it, and so forth. So there's the client, hello, and then we have here the server, hello, in response. We'll close the IP part and the TCP part, and we see now the server hello, which contains the, for example, the exact cipher suite to use, TLS AES 256GCM SHA 284 or 384, uh, and the version to use, so draft 28 of version of TLS 1.3. So if we go back to the client hello, we would expect to see that the selected cipher would be indeed one of these cipher suites. So with this, you can actually look at the packets themselves and sort of understand what they actually mean. Here we enter in the record layer, application data, and now encrypted application data. And of course, Wireshark can no longer contextualize this because it is encrypted. Just by looking at the communication between the client and the server, we can't figure out what's what the encryption key is, right? This is by design. They have this public key negotiation. Now the client and the server know it, but Wireshark is just looking at these bytes. It has no idea what the key is, what the, the pre-master secret is, and therefore I can't actually encrypt or decrypt any of the data or contextualize it any further. But you see all of the metadata associated with it for the TCP part of it, the IP part of it, and as well, headers for the TLS records as well. So the next topic on TLS is an attack on the protocol. So again, as we talked about at the beginning when we talked about cryptography, cryptography is usually not the weak link. Cryptography generally isn't the thing that goes wrong when people, for instance, have no uh, their privacy is lost in the internet communication. What usually happens is that the encryption is just circumvented or avoided or not gets correctly used. The attacks 
that break privacy or security, they don't typically break crypto, but rather they work around crypto. They stop crypto from working correctly. And so that, here we have an example of this. They're called stripping attacks, TLS stripping attacks. The idea is to remove the use of TLS. So you take away the S in HTTPS and you just get HTTP. Also known as HTTP downgrade attacks because you're downgrading a connection that should be HTTPS and making it simply HTTP. So this, these attacks were motivated by the question, how do we actually access a website, an HTTPS website? Well, when you go to uh, cbc.ca, for example, you're not actually typing HTTPS anywhere, right? So how do you get there? And the m primary means is what's known as a 302, which is an HTTP response code corresponding to a redirect saying, hey, you tried to go to this site, but I'm going to take you to this site instead. So you go to cbc.ca on port 80, and it tells you actually you want to go to cbc.ca on port 443, the TLS port. And then your browser just automatically goes to that instead. Or you access HTTPS websites by clicking a link. You go to some website, which may or may not have t be through TLS, and there's a link and you click it and that link is hard coded to be HTTPS colon slash slash www.cbc.ca. So by clicking that link, you're, you're ensuring you're going to the HTTPS version of the website. Or you manually type https colon slash slash www.cbc.ca instead of just cbc.ca. Or you use a browser extension, a plugin for the browser called https everywhere, which basically wherever you try to go to tries to do the https first and then if that fails does the http. These are the means by which people actually start a TLS connection. Because if you just go to cbc.ca and there's no 302 to take you to the HTTPS version, and you're not using an HTTPS everywhere browser extension, and you didn't manually type HTTPS, then you're not going to get the secured version. You're relying on one of these three mechanisms to actually take you to the secure version. And as for clicking links, it depends. It's entirely up to whether the person who put that link there put the S in or didn't when they give you that link for that to work. So how many are using the last two options? Certainly no one's even typing HTTP colon slash slash. So the idea that they would think to type HTTPS colon backslash is clearly not reasonable. And it shouldn't be. Users should not be forced to worry about these details. They should just go to cbc.ca and the right thing should happen. Not that they need to understand the difference between HTTPS and HTTP and type this in every single time. That's not a very usable system. So here's a website and you can see that it is HTTP. It's an older version of Firefox, as you can tell from the Chrome. And here there is a banking online ID and password that you sign into. Now, when you sign in, this will take you to the HTTPS version of the website. So here's an example of a link that you click that will bring you to the HTTPS version. And presumably, wherever the connection that occurs when you click sign in is HTTPS secured, so that password field is actually going to be secure when it is delivered, when it is sent over the internet. It'll be sent to the HTTPS version. So users go to the landing site, bankofamerica.com, but then when they actually do anything, when they click any of the links, they actually become now uh, the HTTPS version. So let's look at these stripper attacks. The idea here is that instead of attacking the TLS connection, such as by you know somehow breaking cryptography or more likely just having bad certs. Instead, what occurs is that the HTTP connection is attacked instead. That is, we stop it from moving to HTTPS. If the website that's originally returned is not encrypted, the attacker is free to change it. So if all the links are pointing to HTTPS websites, we can just remove the S so that it doesn't go to the HTTPS version at all. 
right? HTTPS is reached by 302s or links, and both of these are coming from HTTP, meaning that the attacker has visibility into the thing that moves the user from the insecure to the secure world. The attacker can change the links because it's plain text. The attacker can change the 302s, the redirects, because they're also in plain text. Now, it could be that the server won't let you, for instance, do online banking except through HTTPS, but this is where the attack comes in. You can man in the middle that. So Eve would sit in the middle between the user and the bank and establish a real HTTPS connection to the bank, but the user doesn't realize that there should be one. And as a result, no alarms would go off. So here's the stripper attack. The browser goes to Eve, goes to the server, and says HTTP GET. The server goes through Eve to the browser and returns a web page. And when this occurs, Eve replaces things of the form a href equals col wot HTTPS colon slash slash whatever to HTTP colon slash slash. So a being the anchor item, this is what makes a link in HTML. Basically, wherever there is a link to a HTTPS version of a website, Eve just removes that S. Or similarly, if Eve sees 302 found, carriage return new line, location colon HTTPS colon slash slash, Eve would then change it to 302 found, carriage return new line, location colon HTTP colon slash slash. Right? The 302 location, this is the redirect. So if there's a redirect, remove the S. If there's a link, remove the S. That's what Eve does. And then Eve further remembers all these changes. And this is important because we want it that the server doesn't realize that this is actually happening. So the server is expecting an HTTPS secured con communication, which Eve can happily do because the server isn't authenticating the user. The server doesn't know who the browser is. And the browser just is clueless and unaware that there should be an S there, that there should be security. The user just simply does their web browsing, and instead of having a secure connection, it's just an insecure connection, but there's no real alert to this. So in the stripper attack, if Bob requests an HTTP URL that E is stripped, then e would Eve would establish the correct HTTPS request to the server, get all the content, be able to decrypt it, again, strip all the results or remove the S's from those links as well or whatever redirects might occur, and forward that all to Bob. Bob, the browser, happily gets this information and goes about the web browsing, and Eve has effectively man in the middle the communication between Bob and the server by preventing Bob from using HTTPS. Eve simply forwards to the browser the encrypted traffic after Eve's decrypted it over HTTP. And then, as Bob keeps browsing, Eve just keeps stripping any HTTP links and keeps track of everything it's doing so that Bob's state remains consistent and no alarm bells are given. The result? The server cannot tell the difference because it doesn't authenticate the client. Everything looks like a TLS client requested it. So there is a HTTPS connection that's receiving all this data. So no configuration to say, oh, you can only access the site over HTTPS. That won't prevent this attack from occurring. It needs to be Bob who refuses to use HTTP. And the client doesn't see any warnings. We talked about this before. When you have a self-signed cert, their, your web browsing experience is filled with alarm bells saying you can't, your, your connection might be insecure and all this stuff. And then this is when Let's Encrypt was able to fill in the gap to provide a free certificate authority so that people could just start having encrypted communications for just normal websites. But when you're just using HTTP, you don't see all these alarm bells. So Bob, the browser, would just go about on the web and wouldn't have the lock icon, but that would be it. It wouldn't be the case that there would be an in-your-face warning that something bad is happening, 
Whereas if you had a self-signed cert or you tried to change the cert, you would have lots of warnings about that. But if you just prevent Bob from using HTTPS, there would be no alarms at all. So how can Bob realize that this is happening? What can we do to help help users, to help the browser understand that a stripping attack has or is, is occurring? Well, here we come back to this lock icon. If Bob is knowledgeable enough that he knows he should never do online banking if he doesn't see that lock icon, or if he doesn't see the little lock icon on the web browser, then this connection is insecure. Then he might realize that this is happening and, you know, retype the website, at, manually add HTTPS or something like that. But Eve has a trick that she can do to try to thwart that attempt, which is to make use of the icon of a website so that instead of rendering whatever icon it would normally be there, to change it to a lock icon. So when you access a website, there's this thing called the favicon, which is the little picture that you see corresponding to that website. If you change that to just be a lock icon, then it kind of looks like everything is fine. Right? Here's an example of that actually happening with the lock icon replaced instead of the favicon. One of the consequences of this, these attacks was to change the way that the favicons were placed and to change where the lock icons were placed to make it a little more obvious that these attacks were occurring. And another interesting thing is that sometimes the websites themselves will conspire to harm the user by trying to make them feel safe and confident. So for instance, here we have the account login. There's a lock icon there. There's a lock icon on a non-HTTPS website. So you loaded this website. It includes a lock icon to make the user feel good and feel safe and all this stuff, but it's still all delivered over HTTP. And so as a result, it becomes easier to do these attacks if you're making the user feel good and safe about logging in when in fact there is no actual security there. So the website itself conspires to fool the user, in a sense. And of course, Eve could just insert lock icons wherever Eve wants as well, because Eve can control what actually gets rendered. So this is the problem of the user's mental model not actually matching what's occurring, this idea of least surprise. You see lots of icon lock icons, that should mean it's safe. So how can we fix this? What can we do to help the user out? Well, one is the browser plugin HTTP Nowhere, which, as we had mentioned at the, at earlier, there's a something HTTPS Everywhere, which first tries the HTTPS version of a website. So wherever you're going to, it tries to do it with TLS first. And only if that fails, because the server doesn't support TLS, for example, then it downgrades to HTTP. So that, that plugin helps. Here, the HTTP Nowhere is the complement of that, which is to say, do not load any single piece of information from the web unless it's over TLS. Now, this is a bit of an extreme solution for most people. There could be more alarms when things aren't actually encrypted. This is also a change that is a result of these, or, or more recent than the discovery of these attacks, which is that when your connection is not secure, there's actually an indicator, as opposed to the previous state, which was there would just be no indication that there was insecure. There'd be an indicator if, if it was secure, but there would just be an absence of an indicator. Well, users aren't tuned to notice the absence of things as well as seeing something presented to them. So here we have your connection is not secure. For things like password fields, you may notice now if you if you type your or attempt to type in your password on an insecure website, a pop-up will say this connection is not secure, warning you that you shouldn't be typing your password here. Now, of course, this can be easily changed because Eve could simply create a new text widget that didn't render the letter exactly as is, but drew little pictures of dots similar to passwords without the browser being aware that contextually this corresponds to a password field. But nevertheless, it is a useful thing to have. 
particularly in, in the case of a misconfiguration of the website or something like that. There's also an issue with non-browser HTTP. So if you've ever looked into mobile apps, for example, a lot of the communication, a lot of the information that occurs with these apps is through web connections, through HTTP connections. Apps download resources. They download dynamic code and they run it. They download content. And if you're not actually inside of a browser, you could do stripping attacks on these things as well by just removing the S and and the user wouldn't have any of these clues to warn them that these things are happening. But the main solution to this problem is known as HSTS, or HTTP Strict Transport Security. And the idea here is that there is now a mechanism by which a website can say, I use HTTPS and I always use HTTPS, and anytime you are being told to connect to me via HTTP, this is wrong. I won't give you HTTP links, I won't give you HTTP redirects, I will always use HTTPS. And then the web browser, if it knows that this is the case with the server, it just remembers, okay, here's all the servers that the user's ever visited, just keeps track like a cookie, keeps track of this one uses HTTPS. So that then, as long as you got it right the first time, as long as you weren't attacked the first time that you visited that website, you'll have a secure connection every time afterwards, right? It could still be the case that Eve strips the first time that you visit a website, but if that didn't occur, then at least you've now gotten this HSTS notice for this website. You can store it, remember it, and it'll be there. So you always know to use HTTPS to connect to it. There's a max age field, so these can expire as well. They can be set to a time well in the future. And then the client will, if it has an HSTS statement for a particular server, it will just refuse to do an HTTP connection for any page that where this header is stored. And so two questions here. Again, what is the trust model? What is the trust model? We've seen this trust model appear a bunch of times before, this idea that well, if you weren't being actively attacked the first time you do something, then you're safe afterwards. The tofu model, trust on first use. And it's a useful model because it may be, it doesn't solve the problem completely, but it makes it much harder for the attacker because they have to be ready to attack the first time you do something, which might not be the time that they actually want to mount an attack. And as long as they weren't there that first time, then the user is safe. Of course, another issue for this has to do with privacy, because now if you were to, for instance, clear your browser history, you would lose all these HSTSs as well. And if you didn't, well, then the all of the websites you visit would then be stored. So there's a balance here between security and privacy. 